We're in 1 John, we're busy with chapter 3, making our way through chapter 3, and this morning we are going to cover verses 7, excuse me, 10, verse 10 down to verse 15. So just to remind you of the context of what we are uh, learning there, we're, we're considering four areas in which God's children are distinct from the devil's children. You remember at the beginning of this letter we realized or saw that John wrote the letter to Christians who were being tempted to wonder whether they, or not they are Christians. Because a number of these people in their church had left the church for a faith that is not consistent with what they were taught. In other words, here's people who were in the church, who believed that Jesus is the Christ, who believed that one is saved by faith in Jesus Christ, and then they leave the church and for a different gospel. And uh, these people begin to wonder, am I, a, am I a believer? Am I saved? Am I going to be okay in the day of judgment? And so John writes the letter to encourage them. And in the course of doing that, he gives them a number of criteria by which we can know whether someone is a true believer. Now, in the section we're in, we've seen two things that, dis- that distinguishes people who are believers, who are truly born of the Spirit of God, and people who are not. Those two are who they are. In other words, God's children, we saw, are God's children. With all of the blessings that, ca- that come with that, In other words, God's children receive God's discipline, God's children receive God's love, God's children receive God's particular care, a peculiar care directed at them. God God um, listens to their prayers, God is involved in their lives, not so with the children of Satan. Although God takes care of the world and all the people in it, He has a particular care for the children of God. For his own children. And then also we saw under who they are, in other words, that first area that distinguishes God's children from the devils, is also that they will be glorified. This is not true for the children of Satan. They don't have that hope. And this hope is something that energizes the children of God to live in this world in a way that is different from the rest of the people around them. The second area that distinguishes God's children from the devils is in how they live. And this is really important. This is the moral criteria. The first thing we saw there was that God's children aim at purity. It is the driving force of their lives. They want to be obedient to God. They aim at being like Christ. The second thing is that they avoid lawlessness. They don't indulge it anymore. There was a time before you became a Christian that living like the world was just what we do. We live according to the values of the world. We indulge the things of the world. Now, having become a Christian, those things are done. We don't do that anymore. And then the third thing in terms of how Christians live is that Christians practice righteousness. It is the new norm. Okay? We have a norm different from the world. While the world in certain spheres, you know, pursue morality, have certain moral values, the Christian, as I try to show you there, is not pursuing morality for the sake of morality. We don't just lie because we don't want to lie, you know, and want to be good people and better people. No, this is to do with loving God and godliness. Godliness is what drives your behavior. A love for God and a desire to be like Christ. Remember in John chapter 3, verse 1, down to verse 3, especially in verse 3, he says, he talks about that hope that when Jesus comes back, you will be like him. And he says, that hope drives your behavior. In light of the fact that Christ is coming back, 
You are someone who's looking out for his coming like a bride waiting for her husband. Right? And you're going, man, I wish I could, you know, I want to see him, I want to see him. And, and, and when he comes, I, when, I, when I see him, I want to be prepared. I don't want to, when he sees me, you know, and he's, he, he, what you don't want to see is Jesus going, oh, <laughs> you know. Imagine that. Because you are in sin and you're disobedient, he's going to go, oh. No, you want him to be joyful about his bride. John says, we pursue righteousness because we are waiting for our bridegroom. And we want to, when he comes, be prepared. I don't want to, you know, turn my face away in shame and say, oh, sorry, Lord, I'm so sorry. No. Okay, so, we are different. God's children are different from the devil's children in who they are and in how they live. This morning we're going to see that they are distinct from Satan's children in whom they love. Whom they love. Father, thank you that you have given us your word, but we do pray, Lord, where we are complex people. We are quick to cover the truth of our hearts with lies and deception and justifications. I pray that the word will be powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword to pierce into those areas in our hearts, Lord, and that you will bring to light the desires of our hearts, the the behavior that comes out of that, and that you will help us to truly see us ourselves in light of the word and in light of your um, the way you see us. And so, Lord, we pray that in that light we will know whether we are your children and have reason for hope or whether we are not. And, Lord, if that is true of anyone in our midst, in our church, we pray that you will give them grace to see your love in Christ, to believe it, and to cling wholeheartedly to you, and to receive your your promises, and to repent of sin, and to turn from the things in this world that we that we love, so that ultimately we may be um, truly your children and have this hope and be ready when you come. Only the Holy Spirit can do this in us, Lord, and so we are praying for that in your name. Amen. So, God's children are different from Satan's children because of whom they love. So the question is, who do they love? Who do the God's children love? We are reading chapter 3, verse 10. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Okay? So John is saying, this is how you know. It's pretty clear. He's going to give us two things in this verse. The first is, anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God. Okay? Anyone who does not have a lifestyle characterized by a growing righteousness, a growing Christ-likeness, is not of God, he says. Now, I'm thinking of what Paul says in Corinthians. If there's anyone in the church who calls themselves a brother, yet they are a drunkard, or they have some other sinful lifestyle, okay, they are consistently disobedient to the Word, and when you approach them and they, you... you, you Talk to them about repentance. You know, there's a resistance. These people don't want to turn and change and become Christ-like. John says, that's a very clear indication that they are not born of the Spirit of God. A child of God does not live like that. Secondly, by this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious, nor the one who does not love his brother. So what's the two things he says? First, practicing righteousness and loving the children of God. So those are the two things John says, this is how you know whether someone is born again or not. Because this, verse 11, is the message which we have heard from the beginning, that's from Jesus, that we should love one another. Think of 
John chapter 14, 13 and 14, where Jesus meets with the disciples, what's the one command he leaves us with? Just one command. He doesn't give us a whole list of stuff to do, right? He says, love one another just as I have loved you. That's all. This is the message which we have heard from you. And that's, that's why John says, this is why I can say that this is how you know whether someone is born again. Because of the message that we are left with. For this is the message which we have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the evil one, and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Don't be surprised, brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. It's a fruit of the new birth. He who does not love the brethren or the children of God abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So, who do the children of God love? John says in chapter ten, 3 verse 10, they love God's children. Love for God's children is a sign, John says, that someone is a child of God. So, question, how is loving God's children a sign? So, I've already said something about this, but let me just elaborate on it. The new birth, which is something that we know, happens through the Holy Spirit. Okay? Jesus talks about it in John chapter 3, verse 3. He says to Nicodemus, who was a, who was a, a law-abiding, religious, righteous man, Jesus says to that man, unless you are born again, you cannot enter into heaven. So very clearly, Jesus is saying, it is not good enough to be moral. You can be a moral person and still go to hell. You need God the Holy Spirit to come into your life and do something in your heart. Jesus calls that the new birth. He says to Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now we know that this new birth produces a nature in people that loves God and His children. Let me illustrate this with Paul's own life. Turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 22. We're going to read his entire uh, testimony. I just want to go through this with you, and I want you to see what he was like before he was a Christian. He was a Jew, we know that. Not only a Jew, this guy could say, if you took the law and you judged me according to the law, you wouldn't have found any fault with my life. So outwardly, I was perfect. I kept all the laws. Did all the things I was told to do. Now, of course, you couldn't see his heart. And that's something I think he came to realize as he was born again and the, and the Holy Spirit revealed his heart to him. The pride, the anger, the issues that he had, okay? That was never a problem to him before he was born again. I am a Jew. This is uh, chapter 22 of Acts, verse 3. I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, who in, during his time was one of the, you know, I don't know, think of the, the, the best teacher we have. Let's you know, take the big names, John Piper and John Magatha, okay? He's saying, I was trained under John Magatha, <laughs> okay? That gives him some weight, right? Okay? He's saying to the Jews, this is my pedigree. I was born in Tarsus, but I was brought up in this city, Jerusalem, and trained under these, this man, Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, just as you all are today. So he's describing himself as a zealous Jew. Now, listen what his zealous, his zeal produced. Verse 4. I persecuted this way to the death. Now he's talking about the, the Christians. I persecuted them to the death, 
binding and putting both men and women into prisons, as also the high priest and all the council of the elders can testify. Pause there for a moment. We know that he was trained as a Pharisee, which means he was like a lawyer. Okay? So what he would do was he would take these people who claimed that Jesus was the Christ, took, him, took them to uh, the, you know, Rechterbank, whatever that is in English, the law court. Okay? Take them to law. Uh, to to um, court, thank you. Take them to court. Okay? And then he would prosecute them. And put them in prisons. And for some of them, he even got them the death sentence. From them, that's the the council of the elders, I also received letters to the brethren and started off for Damascus in order to bring even those who were there to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. So this guy was very clearly not a lover of the brethren. (laughs) Okay? And he, according to his own reasoning, had real good reasons to do what he did. These people, in his mind, were idolaters. Who's this Jesus they're worshipping? This Jesus is, you know, some kind of false prophet. We killed him, do you remember? He died on the cross. And so he's persecuting the church. So that's the picture of his life before he became a Christian. Then we know, he tells us, he, uh, when he was on his way to Damascus, he was met by the risen Lord himself, who revealed himself to Paul. And Paul, uh, Jesus says in something interesting, inter- interesting to Paul. He says to him, Paul, it's hard for you to kick against the goads, isn't it? When you, when you use a, the, uh, you know, when you, when you try and get the cattle to come into the, into that um, channel, okay? They usually goad them with a little shock machine. Have you seen that? Or you just, you know. Jesus is saying, I'm trying to do that with you all the time, and you're kicking against it. It's hard to do that, isn't it? What Jesus is saying is, I've been busy in your heart all the time. You, you can imagine this. Here's Paul. To prosecute these people, he had to know exactly what they believe. Exactly. Okay? Because he had to know the counter-arguments. This guy knew the gospel and something was pricking in his heart saying, oh boy, something's wrong. My position might not be so strong as what I thought. And then when he meets Jesus, all of his arguments fall flat. Oh my, he has actually risen. If he has risen, that means he is absolutely who he claims to be. The God of the Jews The risen Lord. And so in that moment, something happens in this man's heart. The Holy Spirit enters into him. And this new birth where the picture in Paul's life was he was blinded, you know, with the light. And it's a picture of what happens with us, right? And then someone leads him into the city. And you know the whole story. Three days later, these scales fall off and all of a sudden he can see and it's a picture of what we are all like once i was blind but now i see what john i believe it's john newton right what he was talking about is there was a time when i didn't understand truth i didn't understand that jesus was truly who he claims to be i i was blinded for my with my own sin and my sinfulness and then he came into my life and those scales fell off And now I truly see. This happens to Paul. Now turn over to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, which is also the first letter written by Paul. And it is also one of the first churches that was established by Paul on his first missionary journey. So here's a guy who hated the church who persecuted the church. And then he's born again. Now I want you to read. Is this the same person? You're going to go, what? 
Listen to how he talks about the church afterwards. I'm going to start in chapter 2, verse 5. He says to the church, We never came with flattering speech to you guys. When we came to preach the gospel, we didn't come to flatter you. Nor with the pretext for greed. You know, it's as if he's saying, we didn't come to get money from you or stuff from you. Neither did we come to flatter you. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ we might have asserted our authority. Okay? But, verse 7, we proved to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. How's that for a contrast? Here's Paul, who was the persecutor of the church, a hater of the church. And all of a sudden, he's talking about the church, and he's describing himself like a, like a tender mother trying to care for her child. What? <laughs> what a change! What a change in this man. From a persecutor and a hater to, I want to cherish the church. I want to take care of her. I want to love her. I want to, like a mother, tenderly cares for her own children. I want to take care of people in the church. What a difference. Verse 8, having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but our, also our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. The new birth changed this man from a persecutor of the church to a lover of the church. Now, there's two reasons that, well, the big reason why someone changes his attitude or her attitude towards the church. The church, before you're a Christian, is like a, you know, a club you belong to. It's just something I do. I tick the box with it. But if you're born again, like Paul, you begin to love these people. You want to serve them, take care of their needs. Think of the way you would love your own children. Paul, Paul describes the church like that, his relationship to the church. So what changed Paul was ultimately the ministry of the Holy Spirit. What changed him from a, 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 a church hater to a church lover was the new birth and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 27, we read that God will give us the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will work in us the very things that God commands. Jesus says, love one another just as I have loved you. You know where your strength comes from to do that? By the work of the Holy Spirit. And so, that's why we say that love for God's children is a sign of the new birth. It's as easy as that. That's why John can say with confidence, if you are born again, you will carry the fruit of loving the God's children. If that fruit is not in your life, you've got to pause. You've got to pause and figure out what's going on. Are you a believer or have you been, you know, mouthing an empty confession? You believe in Jesus, you believe in the truth, and yet there's no reality in your own heart. The reality of, of loving God, of loving Jesus, of loving the children of God. In Galatians 5, 22 and 23, we all know this passage. We know that it teaches us there that the ministry of the Holy Spirit produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and faithfulness, and self-control. The first thing there is love. 
If the Holy Spirit is in you, He will produce this love. And this love, John says, is primarily aimed at God and His children. So love for God's children is a sign that someone has been born of the Spirit of God. Now you might say, but I thought God wanted us to love all people. Love your neighbor as yourself. We have that that command as well. Now I would answer yes, but the new birth produces a peculiar affinity or a peculiar bond or a unique bond with God's children. Okay? The new birth produces that unique bond with God's children. So although God's children do good to all people, they do so especially to God's children. And there's two reasons for this unique bond. We, as people who have been born again, have a common heritage. What am I talking about? Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. If you want to turn there, you can. I'm just going to read quickly. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4. There is one body and one spirit. Just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. He's talking about the church. There's this common heritage, this common things that we all inherit through the work of the Holy Spirit as you are baptized into Christ and you are baptized into that newness of life, you become part of that body of whom God is is Lord. He says, there's one body like that. And one Spirit in, working in that body, the Holy Spirit. And they all have one hope, one Lord over them, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. That creates a unique bond It's something that the children of God have that we don't even have with our blood relations. When we die, that's that for the blood relations. But if you are a child of God, you have an eternal family that you will spend eternity with. And that's the second thing that creates this unique bond. They have a common inheritance. A common inheritance. So yes, while God's children love all people, they have a peculiar or a unique bond with their spiritual family. And by the way, that's why Paul says to us, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. Especially. Why? Because that is your family. So, what distinguishes God's children from the devils is that God's children love God's children. The reason God's children will never have this unique bond with Satan's children, with the rest of the world, with people who are not born again, is because Satan's children hate the light. They hate the truth. Listen, back in 1 John chapter 3. I'm reading to you verse 12. John says, We should love one another not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And why did he slay him? Why did Cain kill Abel? I think most of you should know. What's the one word? Right? Jealousy. Jealousy makes you nasty, right? I know that's a joke, but jealousy made him hate his brother. Hatred. 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 He became jealous of Abel because Abel received God's acceptance and he couldn't have what he wanted. Okay? And so he hated his brother. By the way, if you think about it, Abel's righteous behavior did what with Cain? And his unrighteous behavior. Did it throw a light on it, would you say? 
Okay? Something that Abel could go, oh, Cain, Cain, was, Cain was comparing himself and seeing, oh, my works are actually not good enough. Well, God had, you know, God said it to him, but he was able to see that through Abel's own righteous works. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Don't be surprised, brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. It was not love uh, abides in death. So verse 12 and verse 13 tell us that the reason God's children will never have this unique bond with Satan's children is because of the fundamental hatred in Satan's children. John chapter 7, verse 7. Turn there with me. John chapter 7, verse 7. Verse 6, I'm going to start in verse 6. So Jesus said to them, My time is not yet here, but your time is always opportune. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its deeds are evil. Jesus says the world hates him. Why? Sorry, why? What does it say? Yeah, what is he doing? He's telling people that they're sinning. When they transgress God's law, Jesus goes, that's not right. You should, don't go on with that. That's all he's doing. He's testifying that they are sinful, right? And what's the response? Oh, thank you. We love you for that. No. They hate him because of it. Here's the Jews and the Jewish nation and the Jewish leaders and Jesus is going, you guys are self-righteous. You know that, right? And he talks to them about what comes out of the heart of man is what defiles them. While the Jews are going, we are so righteous, we do everything right. Jesus is talking, but have you seen what's in your heart? And then the Jews go, you know, Oh no, hang on, this guy. You know. And they start to hate him because he actually sees what's going on. He sees through their lie and their deception. And when they are exposed, you know, instead of going like David, I am that sinner, they bring out all the weapons they can to defend themselves. And they start to hate Jesus and talk about him you know, in derogatory ways and uh, persecute him. Guess what? John chapter 15, verse 18. John chapter 15, verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it has, hate, has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, in other words, if you were Satan's children, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Guess what you can expect? Okay? We all know that. We've all experienced this to some degree, even in our own families. If you are truly a born-again believer and you love the Word of God and you have people in your family who are not believers, there's always some kind of clash. It's a clash of values. It's a clash of loving God and the truth and people who don't love God and the truth. The world hates the light. Because the light exposes their sin. Jesus said, the church is the light of the world. If you are born again, that is a reality of who you are. Right? You are light. 
Wherever you go, if you are obedient to Jesus Christ, your life will act like light. And there will be people who do not want the light. They don't want to come into the light. And they will, you know, if you're the source, they will push you away. Jesus, in chapter 7, verse 7 of John, says that the world hates the light and they push against it. They don't want the light. So, it's because of this hatred of the light that there just never will be that unique bond between God's children and Satan's children. I'm sure you've found this in your own life. If you do want that unique kind of bond with them, you're going to have to let go, right? Because if you truly stand for what Christ stands for, it just creates that division. And this is exactly what Jesus said. I didn't come to bring peace into the world. I came to bring division between a, a, a husband and wife. That's a, a believing husband and an unbelieving wife, or an unbelie- a believing husband and an unbelieving... Uh, excuse me, other way around. Unbelieving... A believing wife and an unbelieving husband, okay? Or between, uh, Jesus says, you know, between a a person and their their close relations, family relations. The issue is saying, what he's saying there is that when someone is born of the Spirit of God, there will be a division between him or her and those who are not children of God. So that's why that division exists. It's not because God's children are not loving. It is because the world hates the truth. It hates the light, and it will not come into the light. Don't be surprised, brothers, if the world hates you. In verse 14 and 15, John again repeats that love for God's children is evidence that someone is born of the Spirit of God. He says, We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Daniel Aiken says, Eternal life is not earned by loving the children of God. Instead, loving the children of God is evidence that one has has made the transition from death to life. So, John says that love for God's children is the evidence, not the basis of salvation. And it's important to remember that John is talking about a love for God's children that is the dominant feature of your life. If love for God's children is characteristic of your life, guess what? There's factual evidence that you are a child of God. Now, while we'll see what love for God's children looks like next week, because that's what he gets into next, let me just give you a framework, and I'm going to close with this, a framework to measure your love confession. Perhaps you've been saying all along, yeah, I love God's children. Here's a way to measure that. Okay, a framework. We know that love, coupled with wisdom, produces righteous behavior. Okay, that's not very technical. Love, says Paul in Romans chapter 13, verse 10, does no wrong to a neighbor. Philippians 3, 2, verse 3 to 5, love regards the interests of others as more important than their own. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 to verse 6, I'm just summarizing some of these. Love does not act unbecomingly. It is not easily provoked. It does not keep a record of wrongs. It is not jealous. It is not arrogant. Okay? So if you love someone, love coupled with wisdom produces righteous behavior. If you love the children of God, you'll be able to see it. So, let me say it this way. If you love God's children, you are one who is growing in your skill to regard their interests as more important than your own. How's that going in your life? 
If you love God's children, you are someone who is growing in their skill to be patient when people in the church wrong you. You are quick to forgive when people in the church hurt you. You are quick, you, you, you try to bear with the failures of the others in the church. You are kind and constructive with your words. If you love God's children, you will be growing in your skill to supply their needs practically. So, you know what? This is, I'm just giving you a, a framework, right, to, to measure your love, your confession of love. If you say you love the God's children and you want to use that confession as a basis to give yourself assurance that you are a believer, it's got some practical implications. And you've got to look, what is your love for God's children produced? Love, coupled with wisdom, produces righteous behavior. You cannot say, I love God's children, and yet not be <laughs> physically loving them. Okay? So, the children of God are different from Satan's children because of who they are, because of how they live, and now we've seen that God's children are different from Satan's children because of whom they love. Father, Again, we want to end this time together with a plea that you will help us to see our hearts, our lives in the light of the truth, so that if we are deceived, we may come into the light and receive grace. And if we perhaps are struggling um, just to understand where we are with you, yet, Lord, there is evidence in our lives, that often we overlook, I pray that you will bring it to our hearts, to our minds, to our understanding, so that we may rest in the comfort that is truly there for us to hold on to. That if we are born again, there will be evidence of a love for the brethren, a growing evidence. So Lord, I pray that you will bless us with the work of the Holy Spirit and grant us peace. Amen.